great. If you're in a county and no one is designated as working that county, don't fret. Just get a hold of any one of us that are listed over there. We're always happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, I know that there have been folks from other sections of the state that have contacted me. Um, and I know that happens with all of us across the board. So always, always happy to answer your questions. So uh, we've got with us today, and hopefully I won't forget anybody, uh, Kelly McGowan is with us, as well as Tamara, Jennifer, we also have Justin and Eli, and then um, we've got Jared, who's not with us today, hopefully he's got some vacation that he's doing, but we do have Mandy behind the scenes, and she's the uh, lead for us when it comes to the Integrated Pest Management Program on our campus, and so we're always happy when she can come back and join us um, and learn from us and we from her, so we're happy to have her along as well. Um, I don't remember, but somebody changed their name to ask questions here. And so go ahead if you've got questions during our presentations or questions about what we're talking about or a new question that you want answered, go ahead and, and uh, send that question to ask your question here. And we'll try to answer it live. If not, somebody or one of us will try to answer it for you at a later time. So don't fret about um, putting your email address and the ask your questions here because that will be held private for those of you that have that concern about just putting your email out address out there to just about anyone. I would like to let you know that today um, we do not have Pat Canan with us again today, unfortunately, uh, but he will be hopefully with us back next week. So I'm going to pretend like I'm Pat Canan for just a minute. I know the drought in Missouri um, is really affecting a lot of us. So I just thought I would show you the drought map. It gets updated every Thursday morning. So this really is the map from last week. I know that we've had some rain that has hit dirt, certain areas of our state as well in the areas that have seen, seen some drought. I know Jefferson County was in the D0 abnormally dry and now our, my county is 100% clear from the drought. Although I still see effects of it in my yard, in my trees, in my garden areas as well. So the, um, I believe Tamara's dropped in where you can find this map. So if you're interested to see how your county has been changed because of some of the rain you might have, have received, you can go to this tomorrow at some point and get an updated version of that. So what I'd like to do now is just to go ahead and turn this over to Jennifer and let us go ahead and get started and answering your questions. So Jennifer, let's get started. All right, thank you, Debbie, and good afternoon, everyone. Today we have a lot of questions and topics to get to, so we will start with our first one, and it's regarding something eating a flowering quince. The question is, my flowering quince has a number of branches with chewed up leaves. A friend at the other end of town has the same thing happening to her quince. I'm guessing Japanese beetle damage. And Justin, would you like to answer that for us? Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, we had a question related to flowering quince and insect damage. And luckily we got some uh, pretty good pictures from that homeowner. So we always appreciate pictures when you submit the questions because it allows us to get a better idea of what's going on. So the flowering quince for folks that don't know, uh, Catamella speciosa, it is in the Ros Rosaceae family. So um, I think the first assumption of Japanese beetles uh, might have been a good assumption because Japanese beetles do really love plants in this plant family. Uh, but this species is native to China, uh, produces some really nice showy flowers that that hummingbirds really seem to enjoy. Um, it does have some good drought resistance, which uh, would be good for, for this year for sure. Um, it's different than the edible quince fruit uh, trees it's it produces small fruit but they they tend to be bitter some varieties produce uh, fruit some some varieties do not produce fruit um, but the question related to insect damage the homeowner was thinking this might have been Japanese beetles so I just wanted to show a couple pictures of of some common uh, insect damage that you might see so Japanese beetles you know I think a lot of folks are probably familiar with what their damage looks like but they tend to really skeletonize leaves, um, chewing between the ribs and the veins of the leaves and consuming that, that soft tissue. 
Um, some of the other beetle damage you might see in the landscape and garden, um, these shot hole injuries, this middle picture um, from flea beetles, you often see those on, on egg plants, um, especially our, our younger, younger plants, they tend to really cause some problems during establishment. Colorado potato beetles, they produce a little bit different injury, kind of chewing on the, the edges of the leaves on those notched margins. Um, leaf miners, so those are going to produce these kind of strange meandering tunnels because these insects are actually in between uh, the layers of the epidermis. And so they're feeding on that, that soft tissue between those layers of the leaves. Now caterpillars and other insect, uh, caterpillars and insects in the orthopteran family. So the orthopterans are grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. They have chewing mouth parts and they're gonna leave these really rough kind of jagged edges. Um, they oftentimes are consuming the veins, but leaving the mid ribs on a lot more of our woody plants. Um, and after feeding, the edges are gonna turn dry and brown. And so the picture highlighted in red there is a close up of the, the picture from the homeowner. So when we're trying to identify insect damage, you know, the way that the damage occurs can be one indicator, um, but it can be hard to tell when the insect is gone. So there weren't any insects left on this flowering quince, um, but some tips to help identify you know, sometimes insects might be feeding only on the underside of the leaves. Sometimes they might be feeding only at night. And the tricky thing about uh, this particular species is there's not a ton of great information related to common pests. The most common pests that were listed were aphids and fire blight. And so not a lot of information on other pests. And sometimes with our ornamental crops, if they're if they're not wildly popular, we're always going to have more information on pests on our food crops because they've been studied extensively by researchers um, all across the United States. But um, best guess on this one, it's it's probably either a caterpillar or a thopterin, but um, a little bit tricky to identify without the, those insects being present. And that's all I got. All right. Thank you, Justin. Moving on to our next uh, question or our topic, it's on horticulture terminology and Debbie is going to give us a term. Yeah, so this is a, a interesting type of a phenomenon. It's called epicormic growth. And so if either Tamara or Mandy could start the poll, I'm gonna ask you, what do you believe this is a description of? A fast growing tip growth, the growth of, a, of the cell walls expanding the growth of the plant or growth of stems and leaves in unexpected locations on a tree. So I will let you all um, put in your answers there. We'll go for just a couple of more, oh, maybe 15 more seconds and see what you guys are coming up with. Great having folks to answer this get you a little engaged with with besides just sitting there okay so we've got about um 22 folks that have 23 that have answered the question and taken a guess so i'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results so 50 percent of you think that it's c 38 percent believe that it's b and 13 percent believe that it's a and I want to let you guys all know just how smart you actually are. So epicormic growth is the growth of stems and leaves in an unexpected locations on trees, predominantly with trees. And we have what's called an epi, epi, epicormic, sometimes it's hard for me to say, the epicormic bud. And it's located underneath the bark of the tree and it's dormant. And when there is stress or when there's issues with the top growth of the tree above where that epicormic growth is, that bud, um, it's dormant. But once that growth above has issues with growing, that epicormic bud actually starts to sprout and actually starts to grow. And so it's due to damage. So this tree, I took I've got a couple of pictures here and these trees are all in my neighborhood and you can see that that is not the typical way that a trunk of a large tree that is a larger tree 
um, with the growth of those leaves and stems that are on that tree. So definitely that is epicormic growth. So that's a closer up. And I took that through the windshield of my car. I think sometimes my neighbors think I'm crazy because I walk through their yards and take pictures and stop my car. Um, but I do that because I want lots of pictures so that I can show folks and do education. So here is the tree up close. And here is the tree as it looks from a little bit of a distance. So you can see a lot of dead growth. You can see how it's really thinning out in the top part of that. And then here's a second tree in my neighborhood where the top growth of it is all totally looks like it's 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 just gone. It's not it's got some growth, but not a whole lot. And then we have a lot of, of growth that's still on the lower branches. But look at all of this that's growing right in here in this section of this tree. And that's not the way a growth normally is on the tree. So if you see trees like this, just know that this, this tree probably has been under stress or had some sort of damage to it on the upper parts of the tree above where this epicormic growth is actually occurring. So I just thought I would pass that along and great for you guys. You guys are so smart. Thank you. Our next question is, I had a black gum tree trim during the winter about four years ago. Ever since, this tree seems not to be flourishing. Anything I can do, or is it time to say goodbye? And Tamara is going to answer that question for us. I am. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right. So this is a picture of the of the black gum that was sent in. Um, black gum, it's also known as a uh, Nissa sylvatica. It's also called black tupelo. Um, it's really a beautiful tree. It prefers acidic soil that's medium to wet. It needs to be well drained though. This tree does have some drought tolerance, but again, it prefers the moist soil. Some other characteristics about a healthy tree, it has shiny deep green leaves that are attractive and in the fall it's particularly go gorgeous because those leaves can turn deep crimson. It's a rather slow growing tree, it can reach heights of about 30 to 50 feet tall, although MDC states that it can get up to about 100 feet tall. And it's also usually about 20 to 30 feet wide and it's known for horizontal branches that just extend straight out from the tree. So um, the person who sent this in said that the tree looked like it had been under stress. It had been pruned um, a few years ago and hadn't quite been the same since. So I don't know all the specifics of this exact example, but I am going to show some pictures of the tree and things that I'm looking at, and then I'll give you my conclusions. So, um, so this is the same tree as the title slide. So. Um, my first question when I look at a tree, I want to see how it looks as a whole. So I'm it, from this tree, it looks a little bit thinner than I would expect in relation to being fully a fully leafed out healthy tree. I also want to look um, at at the at the base of the tree. So um, you can see right in here, um, the base of the tree. We're zoomed in, and I'm looking for wounds at the base. I can't really see any in this picture, but it would be a good thing for the owner to look for. So this, the wounds can happen uh, from mowers or weed whackers. Uh, you'd want to walk all around the tree and look for any wounds um, and weeping. I'm also glad to see that there's a little bit of a tree ring, though I would recommend make, making it quite a bit wider um, and apply mulch like a donut, not a volcano. Um, and, or you can use living mulches such as hostas. All right, so let's walk up closer to this tree. Um, note the, the change in size for the trunk. So right down in this part of the tree, it's, it's nice and thick. And then all of a sudden there's this weird jut and then it's a lot shorter. So I don't know what kind what happened here, but this is a particularly interesting place on the tree right here. I also don't know exactly what kind of pruning was done. Um, they said about four years ago, but this is something that would not have been four years ago. So this is like right at um, when this tree was was in um, years ago, but I don't see any topping up here. So that's good. But right here, it looks like the leader of the tree many years ago was broken off. So it could have been a really bad intentional pruning job, like a topping or, or it died, um, died back. 
um, or there had been a storm or something like that. But something happened right in this area. And and let's let's talk about that. Uh, so again, zooming in a little bit more, we see how there's a jet right here. We see that this, this part of the trunk is thinner this of the main leader compared to the rest of the trunk. Um, that's that that's something to be concerned about because we can we can tell a little bit of the history of the tree that way. Also, we can look at these these branches that are uh, coming out of the tree and notice how thin this crotch is. And if you remember at the beginning, I was saying that this tree is known for branches that come uh, with branches that come out horizontally. So this this is another part to be concerned about. So zooming back out a little bit, I, I want you to again see these these tight crotches that are right here compared to up here where we have the branches that come out more at a right angle. Okay, so you can also see this kind of growth. We just talked about this, this epicormic growth. That means that the tree is under stress. So when the tree lost the main leader, Initially, I suspect that there was epicormic branching and the straightest one was made into the new leader and a few of the surrounding branches were allowed to grow. So this tree, my conclusions are, this tree is stressed. It is on its way out. It doesn't mean that it's gonna die this year or even next year. It could have a few more good years, but it is on its way out. So that said, I recommend pruning out the epicormic branching, making sure that this tree is watered properly. Uh, remember that this tree prefers moist soil and we've had a few droughts over the last few years. Also regarding, regarding watering properly right now, when we were talking this morning with Hank Stelzer, who is our state forester, he was mentioning that because the drought is so severe in certain areas and the water in the soil, all the reserves, it's they're drying out, um, you probably need to increase watering. So we usually recommend one inch per week, but he actually recommended at this point, if you're in a really severe drought area, to actually increase it to one inch every three to four days. And there are some easy ways to do this. So you can you can put a soaker hose around the uh, the drip line of your tree and let that run for an hour or so. Uh, you can also use five gallon buckets of water that you've put poked holes in the bottom with a nail, so they're pretty small. Uh, and you just fill that up, and you leave several of those along around the drip line, and you fill that up every few days or so. You can use a sprinkler or hand water things, but just remember that you don't want to do this just for 15 minutes every day because that's not going to be nearly enough water. You need to have it be a deep soak that actually penetrates the soil. So yes, this tree is really stressed. It's on its way out, um, but you can you still have a few more years probably. I just take really good care of it. That's what I have. Okay, and now you're going to do friend or foe. I am, so I need just a second to switch my, my presentation. Hold on. Okay, so everybody get your thinking hats back on and we're going to do another friend or foe. So, uh, hold on, I need to, if somebody could access the poll, my colleagues know sometimes when you're putting things up, the Zoom controls disappear. Let's see, I found it again. There we go. So you should be able to see the poll. Go ahead and tell me, is this beautiful beetle a friend or a foe, or maybe it's neither, or maybe it depends. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Hurry and get your last votes in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I will share the results. All right, so it looks like most of you said that this is a foe. We have some people have said it's a friend, neither or it depends. Well, let me tell you what I decided on this one. So this is a foe 
because this is emerald ash borer or EAB. This is this is a really bad beetle. It's an invasive pest that has come in and it's wiping out all of our ash trees. We've talked about it a few times here on this, but I wanted to test you guys to see if you remembered and it looks like most of you did. So just a little bit of a review. I won't give tons of information about this beetle because we have talked about it before and I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat to, to refer back to another video where we gave more information. But this is this is the beetle. It's really small and less than an inch. You can fit two of them easily on a penny. Um, but it is an absolutely gorgeous beetle. That iridescent green just really stands out. They're bullet shaped. Um, it's the larvae that do most of the damage. And it's that time that I mean the damage that they do will will kill your trees. So you can see right here this D-shaped emergence or exit hole. Um, if you see these beetles, you see these um, emergence holes, you, your tree is infested. If you have a tree that is very healthy and you really want to keep it, now is the time to act so that you can protect it. Once a tree is infested, uh, there's not much you can do. So um, I, have to, I had to show these pictures knowing that we were talking about, uh, as, as you remember, we have the epicormic growth. So these are some trees of some ash trees that I've seen, and they just, they look awful. Um, you first start seeing dieback from the, the branches, and you start seeing the tree is just really trying to survive. And so it's just putting out branches wherever it can so that it can start, so that it can collect energy. Um, but when you start seeing all of this, you know that your tree is definitely on its way out. So if you do have a tree that that is dead or dying, I do recommend that you remove it uh, fairly quickly because that wood becomes rather brittle. It's spongy and brittle and it can fall. This is actually a tree that is in my neighborhood. Um, it, it is over a house, it's over tree or over cars, it's over the sidewalk where I walk. Um, it makes me very nervous every time I go past this house because those branches are falling, they are breaking off and they are falling. So if you do have this tree uh, or this, your trees are infested, you do need to, to remove them. A question in here about do emerald ash borers only affect ash trees? Yes, they only affect ash trees and those that are closely related to them. So that can include like fringe trees and, and some other trees that are very closely related. Again, I will put in a link uh, to another snippet that we have that has more information a more detailed uh, description of, of emerald ash borer and the damage it does. But um, if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat too, and I'll, I'll try and answer that way. Thanks. Thank you, Tamara. Well, now it's time to plant a fall garden, and actually fall is, is a great time, and I like planting uh, new plantings of different crops uh, during or for fall harvest. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is my short presentation on uh, late summer fall vegetable planting. Um, I got inspired to make this presentation uh, because I uh, was looking up the frost date the other day and uh, there's a chance of frost maybe in the northern part of the state within like two months, you know, in two months, two and a half months from now, we could be getting frost. So uh, it's time to act. Um, so uh, you're going to be dealing primarily with cool season vegetables in a, a fall planting. Um, they thrive in cool weather and there's two types. There's hardy, they can withstand the freezing temperatures, and there's semi-hardy, which can withstand the light frost. So some of the hardy ones that I really like are uh, radish, turnips, kohlrabi, semi-hardy. It's great to have in the fall some beets, some carrots, of course, lettuce. But not all of these. I, yep. I need to stop you right here. So your slides are not advancing. Oh, really? Yes. And also, I'm seeing your whole screen. Go up to view. I think it's view, reading view. Reading or go view. to go to read there. That Try that. See if that advances now. There you go. Okay, go ahead and start over or start where you left off, whatever you want to do. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much for letting me know it wasn't working. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll probably primarily be talking about cool season vegetables. They grow well in cool weather. It's hard to believe with how hot the summer has been that we're going to get cool weather soon, but it's coming. Um, and so it's divided into two categories. Hardy, they can withstand freezing temperatures. 
and semi-hardy, they can withstand light frost. And this doesn't mean that they'll uh, necessarily uh, continue to grow when it's freezing or frosting out there, but they can survive some of it. Um, so some of the hardy ones that I really like, as I mentioned before, collards, kale, radish, semi-hardy, it's great to have some beets and carrots in the fall, especially you put those into storage for the winter time, parsnips. Here's some great fall gardening suggestions. Um, unfortunately, uh, this uh, presentation it would have been great if I would have done it like a month ago, um, but I was only had worked in my job for a week by then. Um, but uh, it's uh, hard to get transplants this time of year for fall transplants. You're gonna deal with a lot of water issues because it's gonna be hot and dry when you're trying to get established. You can direct sow most everything into the ground. Um, and there's some tips to try and get good germination and try and keep them well watered. Um, it is a little bit rough to get started, especially here in Missouri where it's uh, so hot in August and even September. But what, what can you harvest in the fall? Everything, uh, everything, you know, your garden keeps keeps pumping along. But I don't know about you, but uh, it seems by this time every year, I'm, I'm done with uh, zucchini and yellow squash. I'm ready to get rid of them, rip them out. So that gives me some space to plant something new. And so the first frost in the central region of Missouri is expected by 1018, and it's pretty much guaranteed we'll get at least a frost by Halloween. Um, and that's coming right up, hard to believe. Um, and so there's this excellent uh, publication put out by uh, University of Missouri Extension called the Vegetable Planting Calendar. And looking through this, uh, I thought I'd be good to share some of this information with you guys. So uh, the state of Missouri is divided up into three planting regions, and you can see there's a north, central, and south. You can see that Ozark Plateau, they mark it as north, and that's because it's a higher elevation. So they will get their uh, last frost in the spring and first frost in the fall similar to that higher latitude because of the high elevation. Uh, for the presentation today, folks that are down in that southeast corner, down in the boot heel, are uh, going to have a few more options. And so these are all the things you can grow in the fall. You know, there's, there's lots yet to plant. You know, there's, there's lots of days, you know, that say like that carrot, 70 to 85 days, you put that in the ground. <coughs> um, Right now, and you got quite a bit of time for it to mature, and it takes a light frost and probably get some warm days after that can continue to grow. Um, some things take a really long time, like garlic, seven to eight months, that will also be sown in the fall. Um, but uh, you can see some of these, like uh, the lettuce, you'll be able to do a couple of succession plantings of them. Um, if they come to maturity, you want to keep uh, keep them coming along nice and young. But most of these, you'll, you'll plant once. and um, then harvest them through the fall. And so this uh, this uh, presentation or this document gives this excellent information where it has the variety name and these are uh, uh, selected varieties that do really well and they have some good comments like some of these beans, right, are mosaic resistant. And then according to where you guys were, I assume everybody saw where they were up here. They remember, don't forget what county you live in if you're north, central or south. Then you can see here when your planting dates are. So that second row of dates are your fall planting dates. And uh, so like for bush beans, for a provider bush beans, really good bean, really reliable. Um, Central Missouri, where I live today, is my last day that I can plant it, um, according to this document. And so this is a good guideline to think about. But if you're down there, down in the boot hill, you got another week and a half yet to plant some beans. Hard to believe you can... Uh, plant some bush beans now so get some in the fall but wouldn't that be nice if you had some issues over the summer with some insects to have a little uh, hopefully less insect uh, pressure on your beans and then you get to beets here's a picture of some beautiful uh, Kyosha beets um, north Missouri we're a little late on the planting dates for most of these but central and south Missouri uh, we still got some got some time to get these in the ground uh, carrots <coughs> uh, looks like just south Missouri is left but you could push the limit and get some baby carrots if you live in a different part of the state. Um, corn, that's another one that kind of kind of shocked me. But uh, some of these places down in the boot hill, they got planting corn until 8.15. Um, they got five more days to put in sweet corn. Kohlrabi, a delicious vegetable to be eaten raw in the fall. Put it in your soup. Um, pushing the limit, it looks like we're still good with South Missouri. Um, always nice to have a nice fresh salad, especially when it starts to get cold outside to have something living uh, in your belly that's fresh from the yard. 
or from the garden. So we still have time to plant those. And I would think even North Missouri with some of the shorter varieties uh, to maturity, you can still put some in, um, some of the loose leaf for sure. Uh, mustard greens, um, cook up a mess of mustard greens. Looks like everyone can plant those for a while. Uh, radishes, everyone thinks about salad radishes. I got exposed to Korean radishes about, I guess it's about 10 years ago now, and uh, super versatile. Here's some examples of how you can use them, and you can plant them right now too, and you can get them from Johnny's or Kitazawa. There's a seed company that specializes in uh, vegetable seeds from Asia, <laughs> but over on the far left, you can see that's what the Korean radish looks like. It's about the size, you know, usually coming around the size of a Nerf, little Nerf football, maybe bigger, um, similar to a daikon, but a little bit uh, finer grain texture. Um, so radish soup, shredded radish salad, radish kimchi, pickled radish, the yellow one, the taco one. There's all sorts of things you can do with radish. You can, and after you harvest it, you can freeze it, it'll store in your fridge for quite a while. It's a, it's, it's great. You know, it's really easy to grow. Anyone can grow a radish, really easy to grow and nice to grow one that provides a little bit more carbohydrates than just your uh, cherry bell salad radish. Um, spinach, everyone thinks about spinach for the fall. That's also really great in the spring. In the spring, I don't know if we'll talk about this again, but you can even frost seed spinach, just sprinkle it on the seeds on the <coughs> soil surface while it's uh, freezing and thawing every day and it'll fall down in the cracks and germinate. And then turnips, uh, great for fall soups, nice to get some turnip greens in the fall. Um, so the things that we didn't talk about, the Brussels sprouts, the broccoli, the cabbage, the cauliflower, the kale, all those were a little late to plant them. If you had transplants, you could probably put them out right now. Um, some of the ones that are heading might not do so well, that top row, but the kale you could put out, still get some edible leaves. The collards usually planted in the spring in Missouri. Um, I've experimented the past few years with sowing collards in the beginning of October, the end of September, just in the garden. And they sprout and get an inch or two tall, three inches maybe. And they kind of hang out all winter long, just uh, stay in the garden, don't have to do much. And then in the springtime, when it starts to warm up, they take off and they start to grow and they'll go to seed, but you'll be able, I'm able to get a couple harvests of greens off of them. So it's nice for the home garden. And then garlic, garlic's not uh, mentioned in this publication, but you're gonna wanna plant your garlic uh, sometime before the ground freezes up, probably plant it in October maybe early November around here. Um, but if you're looking for garlic seed, now's the time to get your garlic seed. I think most places are selling out. Um, if you can't find any from a catalog, it might be worthwhile to talk to whoever's selling garlic at your farmer's market and see if they have some set aside for seed they could sell you. Um, something else to think about in late September, you start getting ready for frost. Don't be caught off guard. and might be time to start thinking about uh, your season extension devices, whether it be some floating row cover or a cold frame. I had a lot of luck with cold frames um, in the past for a home garden or even putting up a small greenhouse or hoop house. And here's a link to that publication. Um, the publication is <laughs> really valuable. It's a, a great way to look at planting your garden. All right, that's what I got about uh, fall veggies. All right, great information, Eli, thank you. And now Justin is gonna talk about the responsible use of fertilizers. All right, thanks, Jennifer. Get this pulled up here. So it's really interesting to talk with gardeners um, in my region and all across the state because I think a lot of our gardeners are very environmentally conscious and they're definitely concerned about protecting pollinators, um, you know, helping build healthy ecosystems in their home landscapes to support, you know, diverse amount of species. Um, but one thing that might not top, uh, pop into your mind in terms of environmental issues is is fertilizer usage and how that relates to to the broader environment. So I just wanted to share some of this stuff as folks are probably thinking about, you know, starting to fertilize their lawn in September and October. And, you know, some of the concerns and ways to alleviate any issues with with fertilizer usage as it relates to the environment. So when we talk about fertilizer usage, um, and how it relates to environmental concerns, nitrogen and phosphorus are mainly what we're talking about. 
So home fertilizer use can contribute uh, to runoff, both from rain and excessive irrigation uh, that can bring these nutrients into our lakes, streams, and rivers. And, and this is what's known as nutrient pollution. And the, the main impairment of water bodies across the U.S., is from nutrient pollution. So you, you might assume it's from another type of pollution, but excess nutrients and water bodies is actually the leading cause of, of impairment of these water bodies. So what happens when we have excess nutrients runoff into our water bodies is a process called eutrophication. And so eutrophication is basically when there's elevated levels of nitrogen and phosphorus produces algal blooms. Um, you can see the, the picture on the bottom there. And so these algal bloom, blooms create hypoxic conditions. So hypoxic means lack of oxygen. And it's not so much that the algae is consuming the oxygen, it's that when the algae and other aquatic plants decompose, during that decomposition process, oxygen is used by microorganisms. And so the dissolved oxygen levels can drop drop pretty rapidly um, in our bodies of water. And that that's when we start to see things like fish kills. And so, um, you know, this can be a big problem. You might've seen this in, you know, municipal ponds, um, farm ponds and other things like that. Um, but it's, it's not just the local impacts. The local impacts are very important. And, you know, we all wanna make sure we're supporting wildlife and protecting our, our bodies of water. Um, but some of the broader impacts we can think about is what's known as the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So some of you might have heard of this before. Um, it's a huge area. It, it fluctuates every year a little bit in terms of how big it is, but it's averaging a little bit over 4,000 square miles of, of impacted ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're all in that Mississippi River watershed. And so we all have the potential to contribute to this problem. And, you know, this often gets blamed solely on, on agriculture, but management of home landscapes and, and turf in particular can also be, you know, major contributors to nutrient runoff um, that impairs our water bodies, both locally and potentially further downstream uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So what, what can we do? Um, the important step to start off with is soil testing. So it's important to understand that every soil is capable of providing a certain amount of nutrients um, to plants. So a soil test is the best way to know what your soil actually needs and what your soil is already providing. And that can help you understand how to select a fertilizer. You also wanna measure your lawn and garden areas. So our fertilizer recommendations on our uh, soil test reports always recommend per thousand square feet. So you're gonna wanna know how big your area is to, to know how much fertilizer to apply. And we wanna follow those recommendations as, as best we can. Also fertilizers um, with controlled release or slow release, those are less likely to run off because they, they release their nutrients a little bit at a time and the soil is capable of absorbing those nutrients and, and they don't as often contribute to runoff. When you apply fertilizer, you know, it's important to, to not apply it before a heavy rain. So, you know, we had 12 inches of rain in, in St. Charles County. And if you had applied a fertilizer before that kind of rainfall, you know, most of that stuff is just going to end up getting, making its way into the storm sewer or down the storm drain and into our bodies of water. So best practice is to, you know, either apply before a light rain or uh, if you irrigate at about a half inch, that's um, that amount of water is capable of solubilizing that fertilizer and helping bring it into contact with the soil where it can be absorbed by plant roots. A really important thing is to go ahead and make sure that you blow fertilizer off of hard surfaces and back into planting or turf areas. And so our previous um, state turf specialist said that the leaf blower was the most important part of a, of a lawn care operation or most important tool that a homeowner had to be environmentally uh, conscious and prevent any kind of nutrient runoff problems. So spreaders, um, there, there are ways to calibrate spreaders. I found that a lot of homeowners don't want to necessarily go through the process because it is uh, kind of a lengthy 
detailed process, but if you want to make sure you're not over applying, just put your spreader at a very low setting and make multiple passes um, across the yard. And, and that way you're not ending up dumping all the fertilizer in one section of the yard at a time and just make sure, you know, any hard surfaces are, are blown off back into the turf where that fertilizer can be absorbed. So if you do want to get your soil tested, which I, I strongly encourage you to do, um, we want to take eight to 12 subsamples um, per sample submitted. So we're going to sample from zero to six inches deep. Um, it's also a good idea to sample, you know, your lawn separately from your garden because you're probably fertilizing those separately. Um, if, if your front lawn just never seems to do well, um, who knows, it could be a little bit different soil type. When they built your home, they could have scraped off some of the topsoil. So you want to sample those areas separately and submit a separate sample. It's always a good idea to take the plant material, so grass, leaves, and things like that before you submit it. So you're going to take those subsamples, let them dry out, and then mix them together thoroughly. And we need about two cups to send to the laboratory um, for, for analysis and recommendations. It's important to label your samples if you're taking multiples. That way, when you get them back, you'll actually know what they correspond to. And sometimes drawing a little map can be helpful just to, to know where all those came from. But I want to let everyone know about this great tool, um, and we're going to drop this in the chat box, but this is the MU Lawn Fertilizer Calculator, and this tool can help you understand how much fertilizer to apply as well as how big your lawn is, um, which is the first step. And so actually within this tool, it links to um, a Google Maps developer page, and you can actually zoom in on your home landscape, um, and you can, you can draw uh, areas, rectangles around your lawn so you know that you know the appropriate square footage. So it looks like this one is about 3,163 square feet. Um, so that's that's a really helpful tool just to make it quick and simple to get the square footage of your lawn. So the next step with the lawn fertilizer calculator, um, we're going to go ahead and input the pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which we usually recommend up a pound in September or October. And then you can actually just enter the number uh, on your fertilizer bag. So this 2803, that's a pretty common analysis for what's called like a green up lawn fertilizer, um, which will primarily provide nitrogen. And then you just click on this calculate pounds required and it'll give you the exact number of pounds of that selected fertilizer to get that pound of nitrogen down onto the lawn. And that's gonna be based on the square footage um, that you you found through that Google Maps developer and input on that on that page there. So really helpful, simple tool makes it easy to understand how much to put down and you can avoid over applying uh, fertilizer. And if you would like to get your soil tested, you can drop off your soil sample at any local extension office. Um, we have one in, in every county. If you're not sure where that's at, you can just search your county name uh, with MU Extension. And we have a lot of great services with soil testing. We can also test compost, for instance. Um, but generally, folks, you know, they're pulling samples in the fall. You, you can sample any time of year, but a lot of folks are, are sampling in the fall. For gardens in particular, that gives them time if they need to apply any lime or anything to adjust pH and, and also time to go ahead and source the fertilizers and inputs that they're looking for. So that is all I have on that. All right, thank you, Justin. And now Kelly is going to tell us about fall webworm. All right. Okay, can you see that, Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so yes, we're going to talk about fall webworm. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of early webbing showing up on trees and it will just progressively get larger as we go into the fall. So let's talk a little bit about this because it, it alarms some people. Um, so kind of let, let's talk about it and what can be done if there's a bad case of it. So basically fall webworm is an insect pest of forest shade, fruit and ornamental trees, and they can feed on over a hundred different plant species. So they have a pretty wide host range. Now the caterpillars can feed very heavily and sometimes they can defoliate 
trees almost completely. And they can do this in a relatively short amount of time. The adults emerge in the spring after they've overwintered in the soil or in leaf litter as pupa. And they mate and they lay eggs on the undersides of leaves. And here's a photo here at the very bottom of what that egg mass looks like. It just looks like a hair covered area. And that is the egg mass of the fall webworm. Once those hatch, the larva will spin this web to feed in. They're very protective inside of, protected inside of that web. And so they're in there, they're eating the foliage. And then once they've eaten all the foliage in that web, they expand that web to take in more foliage. And that's why it gets bigger and bigger as the season goes on. So this is the time of the year when we're just starting to see small webs on the end of branches. And this, what it, this is what it looks like right here. And you may have seen these as you're out driving around. And then again, these will just get larger as we get into fall and they'll be a lot more noticeable the larger they get. So as far as control, really the best thing that you can do is just find some kind of a sharp object, whether it's a broom handle with a nail on the end of it, just anything where you can get up and get up in there and break open that web. Okay, just break open that web, knock the caterpillars to the ground. You can step on them, but make sure that you do something to them or they'll just call, crawl back up on the tree and start spinning another web. So that is um, something you can do. You can also remove them by hand. They don't sting or bite or anything else. You just basically take your gloved hand and kind of wipe them from the tree if it's a web that you can reach. Now, I always get comments about people burning them out of the tree. Um, that's really not a good idea because if you're not careful, you can catch the whole tree on fire, especially as dry as we are right now. So that's really not recommended. And it's also not recommended to prune them out either because you're just doing unnecessary pruning of the tree and it really doesn't do a lot to solve the problem because there can be caterpillars in other areas. Now, insecticides won't penetrate that webbing. That webbing is pretty strong and most insecticides are not gonna penetrate that. So it's not really effective for fall webworm control. But the good news is, is although it can be pretty unsightly, they will rarely kill the tree. They're just feeding on the foliage and it's foliage that's going to be dropping soon anyway because this happens on primarily deciduous trees and as we get into fall they're going to be dropping their leaves. So rarely is this going to kill a tree. So you don't have to do anything. And that's all I have. All right, thank you. Well, it's really important to dispose of pesticides safely. And Debbie is going to tell us about an upcoming pesticide disposal event. Yeah, so um, I just thought I would show this to you all. Hopefully you can see it up on the screen. It's at our integrated pest management. We have different little email newsletters that go out and notifications. Um, Sam Polly is our person on campus. Um, when we talk about this sort of stuff, he couldn't be here today and asked if I could share at least this page with you so that you could read about it. And to let you know that pesticide disposal is really, really important. It's amazing that there are still so many different types of, of especially toxic, very toxic pesticides that people may still have in their basements, garage or barns located in, in all those different areas that we may not think about. Um, there's tips here for managing and disposing those pesticide products. Um, so be, make sure you read those labels, um, look at the the uh, purchase date, don't mix anything together, especially if you're disposing of them, uh, never reuse those containers. Um, it's interesting some of the different pictures that he's been able to see and find from different locations. Um, the other thing is if you know you've got some things there, the pesticides that need to be disposed of, the Department of Natural Resources does usually have about six different uh, location sites where drop off where you can bring those items in and they will dispose of them for you. Don't dump them down the drain, down the gutter, the toilet or 
just uh, empty them onto the ground uh, because we don't want to, as Justin had talked about with our uh, over fertilization, putting too much pesticides in our environment isn't good either. And so there is an upcoming event. Sorry, I'm scrolling through real quickly, but I know Tamara will drop this link in or I will um, to determine if there's a nearby a collection. We know that there is one coming up next week in Versailles on August 13th, and that's uh, down here. And there's information on where that actual location is going to be in Versailles. I'll drop this in the box. But also, the Department of Agri uh, Department of Natural Resources has um, waste recycling management districts. You can contact them to tell them that you've got um, some of these pesticides you'd like to get rid of. Um, some of the different collection facilities, and then also to think about is um, your own local city or county might have some distribution locations or collection locations that you may wanna contact. I know my mom lives in South St. Louis County and there is a location where she can drop off these sorts of items. She just calls them ahead of time and they'll tell her when to actually stop by and on what dates and what time. So there are different locations for you to, to reach out to. And um, if you have questions, um, I'll drop Sam Polly's email in the, in the chat box as well in case you've got questions for him. Thank you, Debbie. Well, peach harvest is in full swing right now, and Kelly is going to tell us about picking peaches. Okay. All right. Well, what is in season? Well, right now it is peaches. So let's talk a little bit about that. So they are definitely in season. They're starting to show up around the area. You can find these at roadside stands, at farmer's markets. You can even find local peaches in grocery stores sometime. And um, not only are they delicious, but they're good for us as well. They have a lot of vitamins and minerals. They're a good source of fiber. And a medium-sized peach only has about 40 calories. So you get a lot of sweetness with not a lot of calories. So I often get questions from people who want to grow their own peach trees or any kind of fruit tree for that matter in their own backyard. Um, just a couple of things to keep in mind if you want to try to grow your own. It's not impossible, but peaches are an early spring bloomer. So they're going to be one of the first things that bloom out in the spring. And often we will get a frost that can destroy those blooms, which in turn can destroy crops. So just be aware of that. You're not going to get a surefire crop of peaches every year. It's very frost dependent and sometimes, you know, frost can, can take our peach harvest. Peach trees are also susceptible to different types of, of diseases. So if you are planting a new tree, consider a resistant cultivar. And we're gonna drop a link in the chat box about some cultivar recommendations. Uh, but do keep that in mind. And if you don't have one of these resistant cultivars, you're going to have to um, think about a spray schedule to, to have a good yield of peaches. They also take maintenance. There is pruning, there's annual pruning that's involved, there's training, there's fruit thinning. If you don't thin your fruit, branches can snap. I've already had two or three reports just in the last couple of weeks from people who have lost a limb on their peach tree because they didn't thin their crop. And then of course, spraying as well. So just keep that in mind. It's not impossible, um, but it can be a challenge. And sometimes this is a good reason to just support our local farmers and uh, buy some of their peaches. So if you do buy a peach, uh, how do you select the perfect one? Well, you wanna look for even background color, a real gold color for yellow peaches and creamy yellow for white peaches. Um, green around the stem area indicates that they might not be quite ripe. And then feel for a slight give in the flesh. You don't want it rock hard, but you don't want it mushy. You just want a slight give when you press into it. Peaches are also very perishable. They bruise easy, don't leave 
peaches in your car on a hot day. I've made that mistake before. Doesn't doesn't end well. And just handle with care and try to consume them as quickly as you can. And then I just have to end by showing you one of my new favorite way to eat peaches, and that is grilling them and uh, drizzling with honey. Very delicious and a very easy way to enjoy some of our fresh Missouri peaches. Thank you, Kelly. And we're gonna end today's program with Tamara telling us about some upcoming events. All right, let me bring up that page two. We've had so much good information. I was taking my own notes. So hold on just a second. I'm going to share um, the web page that we have that this is this is if you go to MU extension, uh, so extension.missouri.edu and you search in gardening, and I'm actually going to drop this in the chat so you'll be able to come right directly to this page and see what is on going on throughout the entire state. And you can just see we have a lot of programming happening throughout the state. So I recommend that you go and, and check some things out, see if there's an in-person one close to you, or sometimes we have Zoom presentations that are happening and you can, you can go wherever or from wherever in the state. This is one that's coming up. This is the 2022 Fall Gardening Webinar Series. Um, it is August 18th through the to September 8th. Uh, this is a four season series. So um, check that one out. We also have another one. This is gonna come up a little bit weird. I could show the flyer. The problem is, is then I'd have to share my screen again. <laughs> but um, This one is happening August 27th. It's in the Columbia area, so at the South Farm. Um, so you wanna check this out. Again, I'll put these links in the chat. Let me do that right now so that you, you have them. Um, so you can follow along and, and we're getting ready to close up. But uh, this, this is going to be a lot of fun for the entire family. There's a uh, tomato and tomatillo tasting. You can bring a weed with you for identification. There are a whole bunch of different activities that you can go. It's definitely a family-friendly event. It is $5 admission free. However, kids 12 and under are free. So definitely come and, and enjoy that one. This is another course that's available, Extension Garden Steward. It kind of takes uh, the Extension Master Gardener class, but it can uh, breaks it down into a very simple five series class, uh, but it also spends more time focusing on environmental stewardship. So you can see down here, we talk about site assessment, three season, three season vegetable gardening and food safety, ornamentals, entomology and IPM and pollinator habitat and environmental stewardship. Finally, we have another soils class. Justin offers these uh, for gardeners and homeowners. So uh, this one is coming up September 6th. Uh, it's free. I uh, recommend that if you have not already been through this, please go through this again. There's a lot of wonderful information that, that he shares. I mean, that's, those are some of our highlights. Again, go to that main page and you can keep up with all the different programming that we have going on throughout the state. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tamara. And now I will turn it back over to Debbie to close us out. Yeah, we just want to say thank you for joining. Uh, we just uh, want to let you know, let me pull this up here, go to the right one. So I put in the chat box on how to save the chat. There's lots of great resources there. So when you go into the chat, you see down here, there's three little dots. Go ahead and click on that. And then you can save that to your computer. Um, so you can have those resources and look back at them. I know I keep a bunch of them and I bookmark them so I can go back and relook at them. Again, we have a YouTube, so if you can't join us live uh, during a Zoom, you can watch us live on YouTube if you're in a different location or even on your phone, if you're in a place away from your computer. You can type into the, into the search box right here in the search box, MUIPM, and it will pull up this page and you'll see our live stream. They're uh, recorded so that if you're unable to join us and time is away and you're doing something else, you are more than welcome to come back and watch that at a later time. I know I've gone back to look for answers when I get questions. I was like, I know that somebody did a question on that. Let me go find it. And I'm always finding great information when I go back to the YouTube channel and watch our recordings. 
then just so that you know, our upcoming, we're still going on a, on a week by week basis. If you've got a question, please go back down here to ipm.missouri.edu slash town halls. We've changed our name. We're no longer a town hall. However, you still go to that link and it is say um, horticulture and go ahead and type your questions in there. And we also accept pictures now. It will ask if you wanna submit a picture and you can say yes, and then you can op upload that picture because having a picture can really help us. I know when Tamara was talking about the, the uh, black gum tree, having those pictures there was really good for us to see exactly what was happening with that tree to try to help to, to determine what may be some of those issues there. And again, here's where that is. Just go ahead and sign up. And our contact information, if you want to reach out to one of us where we're located, always happy to answer those questions for you. I'll leave this up for another minute or two in case you need to jot down our email addresses. In the meantime, have a great week and we'll see you back here next week. <music>